my predictions are totally nonpartisan. They have nothing to do with my political views. I predicted the two most conservative presidents of our time, Reagan and Trump, and predicted liberals like Obama. If I predicted according to my political views, I'd be useless. I wouldn't have correctly called the last 10 elections. I've never been fought before, and I'm 77, been frightened for the safety of myself and my family. I am now. If six or more of the keys go against the party holding the White House, they're predicted losers. Fewer than six, they're predicted winners. Can you hear me? Yeah. I hear you. I can't believe we finally did this. I don't know what happened last time. Well, the only thing that matters is that we're here now. Right. I only ask you speak slowly and loudly. I'm hard of hearing. Okay. I can speak loudly. I'll try to speak slowly, but sometimes I... I can hear you just fine. Let me make sure my volume is tuned up. It's not, so I'm going to tune it up. Speak again. Hello, hello. Can you hear oh, me? Beautifully. I am ready to go whenever you are. Got you, got you. Hold on. Let me get your camera loaded for my stream so everybody can see you. I'm not sure they want to, but you never know. Oh, they do. Don't worry. <laughs> All right. Okay, there we go. All right. Uh, how are you doing today? I'm doing great, getting ready to run. I'm training for the National Senior Olympics in the 1500 meter and the 800 meter run. I qualified in the Maryland Senior Olympics. Congratulations. I think, um, I don't remember who it was, the New York Times or somebody you did an interview with, but you were you were doing the running thing as well. So nice to see that. Yes, you're... they did. Right on the spot in the Maryland uh, qualifiers. <laughs> very nice. Very nice. Um, Man, so my, uh, I don't know how much you know about me, but I do, I scream at people online over political stuff. Um, obviously, in this election, I mean, as have been the case with the past two elections, people have been obsessed with trying to predict who the winners are going to be, with some people <laughs> arguing over pollsters and, you know, 538, Nate Silver and election models and all this. And you have your, the keys, the legendary keys, of which I'm sure you've received equal parts, compliments and harassment <laughs> for how you do these. Yeah. Yes, you know, I've been doing this for over 40 years. And every four years, I make half the country really, really mad at me. And after 40 years, I'm sure the whole country is really mad at, mad at me. And I definitely get attacks and criticisms every time. And I have never experienced the kind of hate I've gotten this time. The most scurrilous, vulgar, anti-Semitic, even violent kinds of of feedback. I've never experienced quite that before. And it's just an example, I think, of how Donald Trump has created this violent, toxic political environment. And, you know, I'm even afraid for the safety of my family, to be honest with you. Wow, guys, we have two more events that are coming up before the election. Progressive Victory is organizing an event that I will be at for at least one day in Las Vegas that's happening on October 26th and October 27th. Um, and then if you can't make that one and you'd prefer to go canvas over in Pennsylvania, there is an event on the second and third, uh, the democratic org, the democratic national convention, the DNC, somebody for the Democrats is organizing that one. I won't be at that one, but other DGGers might sign up. If you're interested, check out the link in the description below or go to progress.win to sign up for either of those events. Can I ask, um, real quick, how much, how long do we have for this? 30 minutes, 60 minutes, what? Uh, 30 to 45 minutes. Okay, okay. Just so I have it in the back of my head. Um, one thing that said, so I'm 35, and obviously, you know, I'm in the mindset of this is the most important election ever. We're more divided than ever. But people say that like every election cycle, right? <laughs> you know, like right. music is more degenerate today than it ever has been. And they've said this since for, for, for all time. Yes. It does feel like things are different, though, right? But I mean, we've always said that. Do you feel like things are more divisive now or more vitriolic now than they were in the past? And if so, what are a few things that you would contribute that to? Or do you think it's always been this bad? I do think things are more polarized, more divisive, and more toxic than in the 42 years since I predicted Ronald Reagan's reelection in April 1982, when 60% of Americans thought he was too old to run again and his approval ratings were historically low. And by the way, you know, although I've been accused of partisanship on both sides, my predictions are totally nonpartisan. They have nothing to do with my political views. I predicted the two most conservative presidents of our time, Reagan 
and Trump and predicted liberals like Obama. If I predicted according to my political views, I'd be useless. I wouldn't have correctly called the last 10 elections, but I do feel something different. I've experienced a lot more hate this time than I ever had in my 42 years as a forecaster. And I have never before seen a political candidate who basically says, if I win, my term will be dedicated to taking revenge against my political opponents, which could be anyone that he decides he doesn't like and wants to go after. He said he's going to be a dictator on day one. I've never heard that before. No, he said it's going to be to drill, drill, drill. But drilling doesn't take place overnight. It takes months and years. And no dictator in the history of the country who's been a dictator on day one has ever voluntarily given up power. He said, you're not going to have to vote again, my dear Christians, if you vote for me this time. Well, under the protection of the Supreme Court's immunity decision, he could declare martial law, confiscate the ballots, uh, essentially establish authoritarian rule over the United States. And he seems to love authoritarians, even giving desperately needed COVID tests to the murderous thug Putin when they were in such shortage in the U.S. and could have cost lives. He's reprised the worst elements of our past, talking about bad genes which is reminiscent of the horrific eugenics movement of the early 20th century that resulted in the sterilization of thousands of people, horrible restrictive immigration laws. He's called his enemies verbin, reminiscent of the worst and most murderous dictators. So yes, I do see something new and frightening. And as I said, I've never been fought before, and I'm 77, been frightened for the safety of myself and my family, I am now. Why do you think things are like this? How do you think the conservative movement got so, I don't wanna say bad, but there, there's like, there's a, there's a type of populist anti-establishment rhetoric that I think is pervasive among the right right now um, that feels like it goes a little bit harder, a little bit deeper than it has in the past, right? Whereas conservatives maybe historically have been like, oh, I don't know how I feel about schools. You know, they wouldn't have said, I don't trust every part of the government. I, like, you wouldn't see the, the conservative movement in the past saying things like, I don't even trust the FBI. I don't trust any of the intelligence. I don't trust the military. Uh, I don't trust big corporations. I don't trust any of these things. Why do you think it's gotten so bad specifically on the right? Well, I think it's in part Donald Trump, you know, a, a uniquely toxic, egomaniacal political figure. But I think you're not quite correctly representing the conservative movement because Donald Trump, while an anomaly in terms of his personality, is not an anomaly in terms of the history of the conservative movement. What was the big grassroots conservative movement in the 1920s that elected senators, governors, congressmen, members of state legislatures? The Ku Klux Klan, which was virulently and bitterly anti-black, anti-Catholic, anti-Jewish. Have we forgotten uh, Joseph McCarthy, in a sense, kind of a Trump before Trump, who went after homosexuals, alleged radicals, uh, ruined uh people's lives? Have we forgotten that to date the most intrusive government program was not instituted by liberals, it was instituted by conservatives, the prohibition movement, it killed an industry, it destroyed the laws of nearly half the states, it tripled the law enforcement budget of the federal government, it spawned organized crime. And we're seeing that now being reprised in the attempt to uh, deport you know, every immigrant, that would be even more intrusive than prohibition. You know, immigrants don't live in separate communities with big signs saying undocumented immigrants live here. They're integrated into the entire population. They're married to citizens. They're married to legal residents. Their kids are citizens. Their kids are legal residents. You would literally have to demand the papers and proof of many tens of millions of persons if you wanted to uh, deport undocumented immigrants. And of course, if you wanted to establish a fetal life law, you would then have the federal government intruding in the reproductive lives of women across the country. So I think, you know, Trump is a uniquely toxic personality, but I don't think it's just Trump. I think that's a big mistake. If Trump blitted out tomorrow, I don't think there'd be that much change in the modern 
Republican conservative movement. What do you think is the future of the conservative movement after Trump? Well, actually, wait, let me ask one quick question, because I said this completely incorrectly before. In 2020, um, when Trump lost or or didn't lose, I guess, depending on who you ask. But <laughs> for the rest of us, when Trump lost in 2020, I figured he wouldn't run again. You can't lose an election and then rerun against the same guy that you lost to four years later. He's already like, there's just no way. And he did. If Trump loses this election, do you think he'll run again in 2028? Or do you think he'll kind of step aside? Will the Republican Party tolerate it? Will the constituents be too supportive of him for him to leave? Like, what do you think will happen? Well, you know, the Republican Party is so sycophantic, uh, is, so, is so, you know, united behind Trump. I, I think, sure, they would uh, nominate him again. But, you know, he's going to be 82 years old. He's not in the greatest of health. I'd be really surprised if he was vigorous and sharp enough to run four years from now. You know, I have a lot of problem with the with the mainstream media. I go back to the old saying re- reiterated by many philosophers it's not just the evil people who wreak havoc on our world. It's the good people who don't do enough to stop them. And the media has been very much complicit with Donald Trump. You know, they've given him immense coverage because he creates ratings. You know, every day during his trial, Trump goes out, speaks uncontested, lies, you know, attacks the judge, attacks the judge's family, attacks the justice system. and says the same thing, and yet the media reports it every single day. Plus, they are far too much treating this election as though it were a normal election of policy clashes. It's not a normal election of policy clashes. Policy is irrelevant to Donald Trump. He couldn't care one whit about policy. He cares about imprinting his stamp on the government, which means enriching himself, destroying his political opponents, snuffing out the free press very much. And he's, you know, he's been explicit about this. It's not like you have to discern it. Who's his big buddy who he's embraced? Viktor Orban of Hungary. And what has Viktor Orban done? Destroyed the political opposition and destroyed the free press. You know, the press spent two weeks, headlines every single day, blasting Biden for so-called, you know, uh, mental decline, perhaps legitimate. Why aren't they spending every single day blasting Donald Trump for his obvious decline? You know, he rants incoherently for his lives and for his clear and present danger to the survival of our democracy and the freedom and safety of every American. You know, I'm always reminded of the statement during Nazi Germany of Pastor Niemöller, where he said, First they came for the Jews, and I didn't care because I wasn't Jewish. Then they came for the Catholics, and I didn't care because I wasn't Catholic. Then they came for the communists, and I didn't care because I wasn't communist. And then they came for me. We have no idea who Trump is going to come for once he becomes president, protected by the Supreme Court's immunity decision. You know, a prosecutor who is involved in Watergate recently wrote a column saying, if the Supreme Court's immunity decision had been in effect in the 17, in the, in, excuse me, in the 1970s, then Richard Nixon could have done worse things than he did in Watergate, got away with it scot-free, and our democracy would have died 50 years ago. One of the difficult challenges of the early, uh, I guess, like presidency of Donald Trump was I noticed that media was having this weird issue where Trump was doing a lot of unprecedentedly bad things, things that probably should have been called out or, or things that needed to be commented on. But you ran into this world where when you commented on it, people would start saying, wow, you are deranged. You have Trump derangement syndrome. You're just calling him out over and over again. It's so unfair. And then it feels like the media kind of receded and they were like, okay, well, let's not call him out as much on things because everybody just thinks we're obsessively you know, hateful of him. And I feel like we're in this weird world now where even when conservatives aren't on the network, conservatives are still able to control the narrative because they've imprinted so much in the mind of the media that they have to be 
fair. And I'm not saying that they have to be fair, but I was screaming uh, on my stream at my at my monitor when I'm watching you know them them talk to walls and they're like in the in the 1980s or whatever, you know, you said that you went to China and you were there three months after or for, you know, Tiananmen Square and, you know, how could you say this or whatever? And they treated that question the same as for J.D. Vance. They were like, you know, would you help Trump steal the election again? Or would you help, um, or, or do you believe in the results of the election? They're, like, these questions are the same thing. Like, they mean the same thing. Like, they matter as much for a, a candidate, you know, for vice president, to be fair, not president president. But th this obsession with the media to try to remain impartial or at least to be perceived as impartial, sometimes I feel like causes them to, to I guess, like, seed more ground to the conservative argument than they should be. What do you think? What is your suggestion for how the media should navigate that environment? Where if you cover Trump, honestly, you're going to look like you're an unhinged, obsessive hater. And if you try to uh, be more fair, you end up just sane washing what is an insane campaign. You put your finger right on, right on the truth here. You know, I've said for a long time, you could define Republicans and Democrats or liberals and conservatives in one sentence. Republican conservatives have no principles, Democratic liberals have no spine. And I think that's still correct. Republicans clearly have no principles because it doesn't matter what Donald Trump does to destroy our democracy, to undermine our society, to threaten our freedoms. It makes absolutely no difference to them. They care about one and only one thing, and that is seizing and maintaining power. But as you say, liberals and Democrats aren't playing hardball like the Republicans do. They're playing wiffle ball. They're afraid, as you said, to be called out and to be considered unfair and to be considered political. And, you know, the poster child for this, I hate to say it, is an old buddy of mine. I've known him for 60 years and more. Friend of mine thought he was maybe the greatest federal judge of his time. Do you know who I'm talking about? No, should Merrick I? Garland. Oh, no. Oh, so I, yeah, I know what you mean. Yeah. Of being seen as political that he diddled for almost two years before he did what was obvious, you know, appoint a special prosecutor to investigate the way in which Trump was trying to undermine our democracy and steal an election. We all know what he did right after January 6th. Why wait almost two years? You know, it is the classic example of what I said. It's not just evil people, it's good people who don't do enough to stop them. And that's happened with the rise of every internal dictator. Democrats and liberals, and in particular press, have to grow a spine, forget about the criticism, and tell the truth. That's what they're supposed to do. You know, they're supposed to uh, comfort the afflicted and afflict the comfortable. And they're not doing that. They're not doing their job. If there's, you know, one word or maybe two words I would eliminate from the English language, it's both sides. It's not both sides. You know, whatever you may think of Harris, you may hate her policies. She's a mainstream politician. Same kind of politician we've had for decades. You know, whether it be George W. Bush Gerald Ford, Barack Obama, uh, she's not going to threaten our society and our democracy. Trump is different and has got to be treated as different. You know, we have all this criticism of Harris. Oh, she's not specific enough for their policies. Big deal. They're all going to change anyway when she gets into Congress, and that's a, when she gets into office and has to deal with the Congress and interest groups. And meanwhile, every day Trump is saying things that threaten our survival as a society, and they're kind of treating them as equal. One of the things that I've kind of realized as a, um, so I, I do a lot of like political debate basically, and it's very frustrating that in, in my world, I mean, I try to do research, I try to be very fact-based, um, but when I'm arguing with people, I notice that sometimes there's a different set of rules that especially on the conservative side, you can kind of bounce from thing to thing to thing to thing, and you might not know anything about a particular thing, but when you land on something, you decide to fight on that hill and die on it, but you'll be ignorant of everything else. So, for instance, if you were to ask a conservative, um, do you know anything about false slates of electors in 2016? I don't even know what an elector slate is. Okay. Um, do you know anything about Jared Kushner, Saudi Arabia? No, I don't know anything about that. 
okay, do you know anything about, um, you know, Trump's New York State case or what happened at Mar-a-Lago? I know that it was all corrupt. Okay. Well, do you know anything about Hunter Biden? Oh, Hunter Biden worked for Burisma for these years. I know that he communicated with this prosecutor. I know blah, blah, blah. Like, they know everything about these particular facts, you know, that they've seen disseminated on right-leaning media over whatever particular conspiracy they believe in, right? They can give you the exact number of cats and dogs that they think were eaten in Springfield, or they can tell you exactly how many machines are creating the hurricanes for Florida or whatever. You know, they have all these things in their mind. What is, how do we fix like the media environment where half of America right now is literally living in a different world. Like it is a different set of facts and there's no way to reconcile because at the end of the day, if I tell you 10 million illegals are coming across the border or 500,000, you don't know, you have no idea and you're never gonna know and you're never gonna have an idea of it. But whatever somebody tells you, you believe, how do you reconcile that? Do you need legislation? Is it a culture change? Yeah, what is your suggestion for that or what do you think? Well, you put your finger on something uh, extremely important. And that is the big lie. It has been the staple of dictators throughout history. People are not fact checkers, as you point out. If you say something loudly and long enough from an authority figure who you admire, people will come to believe it. That's nothing new. Here's what is new. It it is social media, which divides us into bubbles, impenetrable bubbles. As you say, if you're in the right wing bubble, you're being fed all this stuff about Hunter Biden and the Biden crime family and 10 million bloodthirsty, undocumented immigrants ready to slit your throat. And you don't get any alternative information. It never gets through the bubble. It's just the swamp. It's the commies. It's the liberals. We don't even have to listen to that. As you say, we don't even know about it because it never, ever reaches us. And I have a book. I have a book on everything. I have 14 books. (laughs) This is called 13 Cracks, Repairing American Democracy After Trump, in which I talk about you've got to go after these uh, media companies and begin to change the algorithms and open things up and break these bubbles. It's really hard to do, but it's absolutely essential. I also pointed out there are now techniques that are very good They've even better refined since I wrote the book, I think in 2021, for instant fact checking. You know, you can't just let people lie blatantly without fact checking them. You know, Trump says, I ordered 10,000 National Guardsmen to protect the Capitol and Nancy Pelosi rebanded the order. Well, one, there was no such order. His own officials said there was no such. And Nancy Pelosi has nothing to do with security of the Capitol. Or he says, everyone agreed we should overturn Roe versus Wade and bring it back to the states. Well, every survey shows over 60% of Americans thought just the opposite, that Roe versus Wade should not be overturned. Not difficult to fact check these and put it right up there on the screen every time someone says one of these blatant lies. I understand there are gray areas where it may be difficult, But when Donald Trump speaks or J.D. Vance speaks, you know, or, you know, Haitians eating cats and dogs, it's not gray area. It is readily acceptable to fact checking. And it should be. And again, the media shouldn't be afraid of being accused of being biased. You know, fear is the killer. And unfortunately, too many of the good people in our society are paralyzed by fear. Yeah, there's this weird continuum fallacy thing that happens where people are like, well, how would you fact check a claim? And they'll pretend that the claim is like, you know, minimum wage is good for, uh, for, for you know, the poorest of workers. And it's like, okay, that's a difficult claim to fact check. That you know, is. Machines creating hurricanes or FEMA preventing supplies from getting to people or FEMA, all the all the aid is just a loan and they're going to steal your house. These are not difficult claims to fact check. And this, no. yeah, this weird equivalency of like, well, you know, it's hard to fact check the toughest claims ever made uh, in economics. And that's like the same as fact checking, you know, whether Haitian migrant gangs are destroying Ohio. Like these, these are not the same type of claim. Um, I feel like a lot of issues that come up also, you said this, you kind of hint, you alluded to this and something you just said that I feel like a lot of Americans just don't understand basic civics. And because they don't understand basic civics, there's a lot of stuff that's immediately inappropriate or not okay 
but you have to explain quite a bit to make somebody understand why. Like, for instance, Donald Trump relying on a whole bunch of private legal counsel, that's very weird, um, that Giuliani and Powell and Eastman and all these guys, these are not White House counsel. These are not counselors to the president of the United States. These are just private lawyers that Donald Trump has hired. Um, and, and having this kind of breakdown of understanding, or like FEMA, where does the money come from, or who votes on it, or what is the, you know, the chain of command of this? Like, why didn't Pelosi protect, you know, the, the Capitol building? It's like, Pelosi's, you know, just a member of Congress. Donald Trump is the head of the National Guard that would be deployed to DC. These are just basic civics things. Do you feel like American education or American average American understanding of how the government works has gotten worse or has it always been just kind of whatever and it just hasn't been tested that much or? I'm not sure it's gotten worse, but there is a war against knowledge and a war against education. If you read any recent books on how dictatorships take hold, the way in which dictatorships begin is through the manipulation of information and education. That is their technique. And we're seeing that all over red states. You know, they're banning books that present contrary views to conservative orthodoxy. They are forcing teachers to teach false conservative orthodoxy, such as discrimination no longer exists in America, there's no lingering discrimination, even though 99% of the scholarship proves otherwise. You know, they pass legislation. You can't talk about people with alternative lifestyles in the schools. There is a war going on for the truth. And if those who value the truth and not just political orthodoxy lose this war, and then, you know, that, that is a step on the pathway to losing our freedom and losing our democracy. So I think it is critically important that people who are devoted to the truth, you know, combat what's going on in every possible way and, uh, you know, rededicate ourselves to really sound history and sound civic education. It's, it's a long-term trench warfare. It's not a battle that's going to be won overnight. Okay. I got two quick ones. One, because I've got a guy that's a big fan of you um, who fights a lot of my community over this. Um, the first one is, do you still think that Biden would beat Trump in the presidential election if he was still the candidate? And then the second one is- well, One at a time. Oh, yeah. I'm an old man. Oh, yeah. Go for it. Yeah, go for it. Do you think first. that Biden would beat Trump? Yeah. I never said that. Okay. What I did say was a lot would have to go wrong for Biden to lose, but it could. Never made a final prediction until Biden was out of the picture. I was very critical of what the Democrats were doing, openly trashing viciously their sitting president, right out in public. I've never seen that, and I've studied our politics since the founding. I also thought Democrats were headed for a disaster. That is, that they would push Biden out and then have a big party brawl for his successor. On my 13-key system, that would cost the Democrats two keys, the incumbency key and the incumbent party contest key. No White House party since 1900 has ever gotten reelected when they've lost both those keys. But somehow, maybe they listened to me, who knows, I said it a lot, uh, Democrats grew a spine and a brain and united behind Harris and only lost one key, the incumbency key. I also noted that the Harris candidacy probably helped the Democrats with two other keys. The third party key, voters didn't have to choose between two old white guys anymore. Hate saying that being an old white guy, but it's true. And social unrest, because the unrest had been directed against Biden and he's now in the background. So the keys fully take into account what uh, happened unprecedented within the Democratic Party. I never said, and I never would ever say that, that Biden would have won because I don't deal in hypotheticals. And we have no idea what would have happened if Biden stayed in. You know, it was a long time to go and all kinds of things could have happened. Okay. And then question, um, sure. I'm just curious, obviously, um, you've designed the system. I'm sure you've seen a lot of people talk about it. Probably a lot of people talk about it improperly. I've watched a lot of people talk about it who haven't heard you describe, you know, some of the keys. If you could change anything about your system at this point, would you? Would you add one? Would you take one away? Would you change the way that one works if, if you could change anything at this point? Terrific question. Every four years, someone tells me, you got to change your key. 
we have an African-American running in 2008. Never had that before. America is not ready to elect an African-American. Got to change your key. We have a woman running. Got to change your key. We have a big October surprise. A major party candidate caught on tape bragging about sexually assaulting women. Got to change your key. Of course, you can change a model on the fly without producing errors. If I had listened, I would have miscalled 2008 and miscalled my call of a Trump win in 2016. Moreover, the keys are incredibly robust. Predictively, I've been predicting elections since I called Ronald Reagan's re-election in April 1982, when 60% of Americans said he shouldn't run again, he was too old, and his approval ratings were historically low, and people were talking about a one-term presidency like Jimmy Carter. But developmentally, the keys go all the way back to the horse and buggy days of politics, the election of Abraham Lincoln in 1860. We had no automobiles, no planes, no poles, no radio, no television. Women couldn't vote. African Americans were enslaved. My ancestors from Eastern Europe weren't here yet. We're an agricultural society. So the keys have survived enormous changes in our society, our demography, our politics, and our economics. That said, look, I'm not psychic Gene Dixon with a crystal ball. I'm not Speaker Mike Johnson who claims the Almighty talks to him. I'm an historian. The keys are based on 160 years of history. They are very robust, but I'm not so arrogant as to say it's impossible that there could be some unprecedented cataclysmic change to shift the pattern of our politics. The problem is you can never know that, just like a scientific revolution. Can't predict it in advance. You can only know it after it has occurred. That's why I don't change my keys on the fly. Can I be wrong? Of course. I'm a human being. Any human being can be wrong. Gotcha. All right. And then just as a reminder, where are we at right now at this moment in time for Kamala and Trump? How many keys does Kamala have? Right. The way it works on my 13 keys, which gauge the strength and performance of the White House party, unlike the punditry and the polls, there's a big message here. It's governing, not campaigning that counts, and that's what the 13 keys gauge. And the way it works, if six or more of the keys go against the party holding the White House, they're predicted losers. Fewer than six, they're predicted winners. So, so the easiest way to look at it is to tally the keys that are negative for the White House party. They lost the mandate key because they lost U.S. House seats in 2022. They obviously lost the incumbency key. Biden's not running. It's a binary key. They lose the incumbent charisma key. Whatever you may think of Harris, she's only been a candidate for a little while. She hasn't reached the stature of an FDR, a once in a generation, across the board inspirational candidate, which is needed to secure that key. So that's three. They lose the foreign policy failure key. The Middle East is a disaster. It's a humanitarian catastrophe with no end in sight. We might not be fighting those wars, but we have deep interests in the Middle East. That's four keys down. That's two keys short of the six negative keys that would be needed to predict Donald Trump returning to the White House. And so the keys predict we're going to have a path-breaking president, the first woman president, cracking at least shattering the glass ceiling, and the first president of mixed African and Asian descent. A Steve kind of foreshadowing where our society is going. We're rapidly becoming a majority-minority country. Old white guys like me are on the decline. All right. Do you think what is, um, well, that's the final question, I guess. What do you think are the two keys that they're most likely in, in danger of losing or that could most, I know you're not, you don't predict the exact outcomes of keys in the future. No, of course but, yeah, not. What do you think are the two that would be the ones you'd be the worried, the worried well, the most? Well, the shakiest key mm -hmm. is uh, the foreign policy success key. Uh -huh. I give that to the administration because it was Biden and Biden alone who put together the coalition of the West that stopped Putin from conquering Ukraine and going after our NATO allies and deeply endangering America's national security. Despite very limited Republican support, his support has kept Ukraine alive for more than two and a half years, 
even enable them to make an incursion into Russia. I think this will go down as an historic presidential achievement. But, you know, wars are fluid. And I suppose there could be a catastrophe in Ukraine. I've also been blasted for not giving the incumbent, they should be the challenger charisma key, which would count against the White House party to Trump. People say, how can you say Trump's not charismatic? And my answer is simple. It's not what you think of him. It's whether he fits the key, how it's defined and how it's been answered since 1860. And you have to be one of those runs in a generation across the board, inspirational candidates. You can't just appeal to a narrow base like Trump did in four years as president. His approval rating was 41% on average, right at the bottom uh -huh. of presidents. In two elections, he lost the vote of the people by 10 million votes. His approval rating has never hit 50% in, in, in 10 years almost. It's pretty much higher than the low 40% range. So whatever you think of him, he clearly, it's not close, does not fit the definition of the key. Steve, every day I get people claiming they know better how to define my keys and call my keys than I do. And I have a simple answer. You want to develop your own system based on your own definitions and your own calls? Go right ahead. I encourage it. But if you're going to use my system, you got to stick to how the keys are tightly defined. I have 30 pages in my book predicting the next president, the keys to the White House 2024, on turning the keys. So you got to stick to the system if you want to use the system. And, of course, these people never develop their own predictive system. If you want to further follow my analysis of the keys, I have a live show with my son every Tuesday and Thursday at 9 p.m. Eastern at Alan Lichtman YouTube. That's A-L-L-A-N-L-I-C-H-T-M-A-N YouTube. Gotcha. All right. Thank you so much for the link to your show. I'll throw it in all my chats. Uh, good luck with your races that you are training for. And yeah, any other final thoughts or places where you want people to look for you as well or any books you want to plug or anything? Yeah, I, I'm also, you know, on every, every social media at Alan Lichtman YouTube. Please, you know, consult my book if you want to know how the keys are defined and how they are answered. And uh, my final word is keep your eye on the big picture don't be distracted by day-to-day -day events and understand the big message, which is a very positive message to everyone listening to us. It's governing, not campaigning that counts. And you, the American people, historically have responded positively to positive governing. Awesome. Thanks a lot. I really appreciate the conversation. I enjoyed it very much. Thank you. Have a Send good me a link. Gotcha. Bye.